This meeting Ingemar. is being recorded. Ingemar, did yeah. you try to share your screen or did, what, what happened? Oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, yeah, let's make share it screen, reason. yes. We see you. Yeah, and now we presumably see my screen. Yes, now we see. And now we see it better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whoops, the wrong screen, the wrong picture. Um, it was this thing I wanted to share. Okay, uh, so I will talk about um, what I call two unsolved problems from quantum information theory. Um, and they're mostly known by their acronyms. The first problem is called the problem of finding complete sets of mutually unbiased bases. It's known by the acronym MUB. And it was first raised in 1981 by Ivanovich. The second problem is that of finding symmetric informationally complete POVMs. That's called the SEEK problem, first raised by Sauner in 1999 and by Rehnes et al. a few, few years later. And the question is whether these things exist. I haven't told you what they are yet, but I will. Whether these things exist in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces of any dimension D. Uh, as you can see from the dates, like 1981, these problems are quite old. In fact, in 1981, quantum information theory was only in its infancy. So it would perhaps be better to call it two problems from finite dimensional quantum mechanics. What quantum? But first of all, they, they've attracted some interest in quantum information theory. And secondly, quantum information theory has taught us that finite dimensional Hilbert spaces are frequently the most relevant ones experimentally. So what are these things? And I'll begin with I'll begin with maps. We like yes. So two uh, so that concerns orthonormal bases. Suppose you have two orthonormal bases in dimension D with these vectors and those vectors, and suppose any vector from one of the bases scalar with any vector from the other bases have absolute values squared equal to one over D, a constant. Then you say that these bases are mutually unbiased. You can see that this is a rather natural, natural version of the relation between position and momentum in infinite dimensions. So it's sort of a natural thing to ask for. A complete set of such things means that you want the maximum possible number of such mutually unbiased bases. And it's easy to prove actually that the maximum, you cannot have more than D plus one mutually unbiased bases in a given dimension. Um, if you have that, you, you said to have a complete set. The original motivation for considering such things had to do with quantum state tomography. So the setting is that you have um, an infinite supply of copies of an unknown quantum state described by some density matrix, and you want to determine that density matrix by means of measurements. So if you use a projective measurement, you're going to deter and repeat the measurement an infinite number of times, you're going to get D probabilities. So D minus one real parameters is what you determine. But the number of parameters in a density matrix is d squared minus 1. And because of this nice equation here, d squared minus 1 is d plus 1 times d minus 1. You see that in order to completely determine the state, you need d plus 1 projective measurements. The reason why we want these things to be mutually unbiased has to do with the fact that in real life, you cannot do an infinite number of repetitions of a given measurement. You only do n measurements. n may be large, but it's finite. That means that you only determine d frequencies, so probabilities up to some accuracy. And um, you can see in this picture, which is supposed to be the block ball. So here's one projective measurement. You have the, the spaces here. Whoops. Sorry. Um, and you're going to determine the, that the density matrix lies, let's say, with it, between these two green lines to some 
position. If you choose another measurement, and you get a similar strip, where you know that the density matrix lies in this strip. And now, because you've made two measurements, you know that the density matrix lies in this red region here. If you choose these bases to be mutually unbiased, like this, then the size of the uncertainty region here shrinks. So it's in this sense that if you choose mutually unbiased measurements, you get optimal quantum state tomography if you have a fixed strategy for it. So that was the original motivation for considering maps. Uh, there are some other motivations, like coming from cryptography, notably. Uh, the original BB84 protocol actually uses mutually unbiased bases in two dimensions. And since then, there have been very many ideas for applications of these things, starting with Waters, who considered discrete Wigner functions based on MUBs. And there's an absolutely huge number of papers that have been written about various things. There's also some interest for these things in classical signal processing. Uh, and now the question whether you can actually have D plus one mutually unbiased basis in a given dimension. So if the dimension is prime, Ivanovich already in 1981 presented such a set that it works only if the dimension is prime. Quite incidentally, it was later realized that a guy called Alltop, who was interested in classical signal processing, he was concerned with an adaptive radar, had actually made a similar construction for prime D the year before. But anyway, everything is always discovered by something else, by somebody else. Uh, Waters and, and Fields, some years later, extended this construction to cover the case when the dimension is the prime power. And in no other dimension has a complete set of maps been found. And it's been an open question whether they exist in any other dimension. So that's the MUB problem. There's a key existence theorem for these things, which was formulated in 2002 by Bandio Parai and some others. They show that the complete set of mutual unbiased basis existence of is actually equivalent to having a unitary operator basis of a particular form. I call it, they form a flower. Uh, let me explain these terms. So a unitary operator basis is something which is very useful to have in, in quantum information processing. It's a set of D squared, in dimension D, it's a set of D squared unitary operators that are orthogonal relative to the trace in a product. That means that they form an orthonormal basis for the set of all operators acting on dimension D. A unitary operator basis is said to form a flower if it can be divided into D plus one sets of, commute, of um, commuting, um, mutually commuting elements. So, you, so um, which intersect only in the unit matrix. So for instance, if D is three, you need nine unitary operator in your basis. You have the unit element, and then you have two elements that commute with each other, another two, another two, another two. So you have D plus one petals on a flower like this. Here it is for D dimension two. This can easily fail because there may be no such um, division of the unitary operator basis into commuting subgroups. A few years later, it was found by Ashbacher et al. that if you put the additional requirement that these unitary operators should form a group up to phase factors, in which case they form what's known in quantum information theory as a nice error basis, then there are only basically only one kind of group that works in this way. It's a very important group called the Weil-Heisenberg group it works if the dimension is a prime. If the dimension is a prime power, you can take tens of products of the prime dimension of the Heisenberg group. And again, you can form such a flower from your unitary operator basis. So the group elements here form a unitary operator basis. And that's the, sorry, that's the only group groups that work. 
Uh, that does by no means settle the issue because there are huge numbers of unitary operator bases that do not form groups. And you can ask whether any one of those can lead to the existence of maps. So that is not answered by these theorems. I should spend a little bit more time explaining what the Weil-Heisenberg group is, this group that forms a nice arrow basis that forms a flower, whose maximal abelian subgroups give you mubs. Uh, the Weil-Heisenberg group is a group which you can form in any dimension. It was first discussed in by Harriman Weil in the early 30s in the book that introduced group theory to quantum mechanics. It's generated by three group elements that are now called X, Z, and Omega. They are all um, periodic of uh, period D, so X to the power D is one, etc. And they obey this omega is part of the center of the group, so it will be represented simply by a phase factor. The generators X and Z obey this relation here. This means that up to phase factors, the group contains D squared elements, X raised to some power times Z raised to some power, and they form unitary operator bases. There is an essentially unique, as Weil found, there's an essentially unique representation of these operators. You, sorry, you diagonalize the unitary operator Z, its eigenvalues will be powers of the roots of unity, and then the X operators acts by translating the vectors in the basis. The, index, the indexing of the basis vectors is modulo D then. So this is a weil heisenberg group. For later purposes, it will be important that the matrix elements here, if you write out the matrices, are pretty harmless. They will, be, they will consist only of, root, of the root of unity to various powers. So that's the weil heisenberg group. Uh, but the existence problem for MUBs has not been settled because there may be unitary operator bases that do not form groups. So, now the embarrassing thing is that since 2007, when Ash Basher et al. brought this paper, there has been very little progress on this. There has been a lot of work, but really not much to show. Numerical searches have been done in dimension 6, which is the first composite dimension, uh, six is sufficiently small that you can do numerical searches, and it has been established beyond reasonable doubt, I would say, but not proved, that the maximum number of mutually unbiased bases you can have in dimension six is three. This is worked by three different groups, one based in York, one in Budapest, one in Singapore. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there are still papers on the archive appearing now and then uh, where somebody has a new idea for an numerical search, but they never go beyond what's already known. Um, there's another strange sub-problem where there has been some progress. So if you consider the dimension six, then you can try to, or you can, you can do this in any dimension, you can classify the set of pairs of mutually unbiased bases. You don't ask for a complete set, just a pair. And then you try to classify those up to natural equivalences. If you do that in dimension two, three, and five, you find that up to these natural equivalence, equivalences, there's only one pair of mutually, of mutually unbiased bases. But in dimension six, there's a four parameter set of those. This was established in a series of papers by Carlson, Schleusi, and Bondal. Uh, this is a bit counterintuitive here because there's a well-known construction by Werner which says that if you have a pair of mutually unbiased bases, and if you also have available a Latin square, of the appropriate size, there are many of those, then you can construct a unitary operator basis from these ingredients. So what I'm saying here is that the set of unit, unitary operator bases in dimension six is huge. It's much larger than it is in prime dimensions. Nevertheless, it seems as if complete sets of MUBs are possible only in prime dimensions, which is a bit strange. 
And uh, with apologies to the very many people who worked on this problem, including myself, I should say, uh, this is basically, I think, the, the, the only important things that have been found out about the, this existence problem since then. And I think the basic reason why there hasn't happened much more is that we simply don't know what kind of mathematics this is. What are we supposed to, I mean, what kind of mathematics is supposed to settle this existence problem for us? We don't know. There are some interesting hints about this coming from Bondal's paper here and also from some other directions, which suggests that there is a difficult part of mathematics called symplectic topology, which may be relevant, but I'd prefer not to say anything about that because it's too difficult for me. Um, so I will turn to the other existence problem, the seek problem, which is in some sense, uh, at first sight looks rather similar to the mob problem, but which in fact has one, there's one important difference. So a symmetric informationally complete P of M <clears throat> is a P of M. That means that there's a set of vectors that form a resolution of the identity. And it should be symmetric. That's the re requirement. So the requirement is that the mutual scalar products or the vectors in the P of M have the same absolute value squared. You can, from this requirements, you can easily prove what these constants have to be, and you can easily prove what the maximum possible number of vectors in such a P of M is. The maximum number is D squared. The original motivation for considering these, there were some motivations related to quantum foundations, particularly coming from Sauner. Um, there was also a motivation similar to MUPS. It's related to quantum state tomography. In principle, such a P of M corresponds to a measurement you can do in the lab, and it's tomographically complete. That is to say, if you are able to realize such measurements, <clears throat> you can determine the quantum unknown quantum state with a fixed experimental setting, a single setting. There are also applications to cryptography, etc. But I should say, and I should admit, that the motivations here are quite a bit weaker than the motivation for MUBS, simply because this kind of measurement is fiendish, fiendishly difficult to actually make. There has people are working on it, and there has been some progress, uh, in particular last year, these people here, uh, there are 14 authors, I singled out the, my, I singled out one of them for attention, Tavakoli, because he's my personal friend. Anyway, these people were able to do seek measurements in dimension three using integrated photonics. So there is some progress in the lab, but we're going to discuss much higher dimensions in a moment than three, so this is definitely a case where theory is ahead of experiment. Now, the difference between the seek problem and the mob problem is that in the seek problem, there has been in the existence problem, there has been dramatic progress, unlike in the mob case. And the reason why there has been dramatic progress is basically that we, we have figured out what kind of mathematics is behind here. And I'd like to explain this a bit. So here's the history of the seek problem. It started with Gerhard Sauner and with a paper by Reynas and Scott and others. Um, they made some conjectures. They conjectured that seeks exist in every dimension. <clears throat> and moreover, that they form orbits under the Weil Heisenberg group. So this group I mentioned earlier that up to phase factors is generated by the group elements X and Z, unitary operators. Uh, that's raised to the power d are equal to the identity. You, you take these group elements, you act on a particular vector called a fiducial vector, sorry. Um, and then you should get that, the result should be a seek if you choose the fiducial vector psi zero suitably. This conject, these conjectures were, have, were verified numerically for all dimensions up to 67 by Andrew Scott. Actually, this work has been ongoing, so so uh, at the moment, Marcus Grassel, who is continuing this work, has gone all the way up to dimension 193. They always exist. 
But I should say that these numerical searches are by no means trivial. I mean, we're talking CPU years here. Um, another thing that was realized was that they answered questions like, when are two seeks unitarily equivalent? And when do they have symmetries? So one conjecture due to Sauna was that they always have a symmetry of order three. That's a rather mysterious conjecture still. And in certain specific dimensions, there are seeks with higher dimension, with higher symmetries. Also, exact solutions were worked out for a handful of dimensions up to 15 using Grebner basis and so on by Marcus Grassel. And so, so that was sort of say the first era of the seek problem. The next thing that happened was that Marcus Appleby and uh, Julia Appleby, um, <clears throat> his wife and, and Gerhard Sauner, they examined these solutions that were available for exact six. And they realized that they could identify the kind of number fields that you need to write down these fiducial vectors or to write down these six. Um, which is an interesting thing. Uh, it's also, so to say, practically useful in the sense that if you know what number field the components are supposed to sit in, then you can take a numerical solution, increase the precision perhaps, and then identify an exact seek using integer relation algorithms. So in low dimensions, you can use root approximant in Mathematica. In higher dimensions, and Marcus Grassel has now pushed this to dimension 55, you're going to need very sophisticated techniques and, and, and much computer power, et cetera, but it can be done. I should say that the work I'm talking in between 2012 and 2016 <clears throat> was not complete. It has recently been completed by Kopp and Lagarias. So we now know, we think, conjecturally, every number field that is capable of giving a seek. More recently, <clears throat> so knowing the number fields is nice, but more recently it was realized in particular first by Gene Kopp, who is a number theorist, not a physicist. Gene Kopp realized that he could identify actual numbers within these number fields that can be used to construct seeks. And um, this has been done in two kinds of dimensions by Kopp in dimensions that are prime equal to two mod three for some reason. And uh, more, younger, more, 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 um, more dramatically, I would say, if the dimension is of the special form n squared plus three, then these conjectures I, I, I mentioned earlier means that the seek, there should exist the seek with anti-unitary symmetry. And it turns out that these kind of seeks, for these kind of seeks, we can identify the actual numbers with, uh, that turn out to be much more harmless. So if the dimension is of the form n squared plus three, we can actually construct six in um, four and even five digit dimensions, exact six in dimensions where numerical searches are absolutely impossible. So that's how the problem has moved. And um, I should say that it's still moving. So the, uh, you, should, um, you should expect more drama coming very soon. To say a little bit, I should show you a seek. So this thing, this disgusting thing that you see here is one of the first exact solutions for a seek. It's dimension six, it's due to mark, <coughs> of course. And these are the components of the seek fiducial vector. In the preferred basis, I should say, singled out by the Weil Heisenberg group. So it's an orbit under this Heisenberg group. There's a canonical representation for the Weil Heisenberg group. And in this representation, these are the components of the seek vectors. And it doesn't look very nice at first sight. But if you think about it, there are other things that don't look nice either in the world. Uh, there's an old problem of constructing regular polygons or uh, equivalently to divide a circle into equal parts. This, has been this was studied a lot some hundred years ago. And while well, you can normalize this by centering the polygon at the origin, and you put one of its vertices at x equals one, y equals zero in the complex plane, if you like, x plus i, y. 
And then the next vertex sits, well, here are the coordinates, the real and imaginary parts, if you like, of the coordinates of that vertex. And that looks pretty disgusting too, right? And this is just a seven gone. It is going to get much worse if you consider higher, yeah, bigger things. Uh, but if you analyze this number, which was first done by Gauss, you realize that it's actually, these numbers are actually very interesting. Technically, in today's terminology, we say that these numbers generate an abelian extension of the rational number field. And what results is called a cyclotomic number field. And it has conductor, if you try to construct a D-gon, it has conductor D. And then eventually, of course, you know that you can express this number very much more simply. Uh, X plus I, Y, the, the, the complex number, is simply a root of unity. So if you have the exponential function available, this number becomes something quite nice and comprehensible. So you may wonder if you can play a similar trick with the numbers that enter the siege. And this is what the Applebys, together with Sauner, did the, fir the first shot at this problem was in 2012, they realized that these horrible things that you see in the vector actually generate a particular kind of number field, which is technically, technically called an abelian extension of a real quadratic field. So first you consider the rational field, then you extend that by adding the square root of some um, positive number, positive integer d, and then you make what's called an abelian extension of that, and then you get the number field needed for this seek. I'm not going to go into, given the time constraints, in what abelian extension actually means, but it has to do with the Galois group of the field extension. Moreover, the particular quadratic field, if you look here, this is dimension six, the square root of 21 occurs all over the place. Actually, what these people found when they analyzed the available numerical solutions, uh, exact solutions, was that the quadratic field relevant for seek in dimension D was always, so this integer is given by D plus one times D minus three. three. This gives you capital D, the integer that determines the number field that you're interested in. So that's the beginning. But this means that we're now into number theory serious number theory, we want to understand what abelian extensions of real quadratic fields really are. And here the problem is that this is a famous open problem. So here's the timeline for the underlying mathematics. So Kronecker and Weber in the 19th century were able to describe all possible, what I'm calling abelian extensions of the rational field. Hilbert was extremely impressed by that. So in 1900, in the famous talk where he presented the problems that should be solved during the 20th century, he asked for a similar description of all abelian extensions of real quadratic fields, precisely the problem with faced with. And the catch is that this turned out to be, well, the 20th century turned out to be sh too short for that. There was progress. So in the 1920s, Takagi was able to classify all such abelian extensions. We're relying on that. In the 1970s, Harold Stark and Shintani uh, were able to conjecture what is, so say, an analog of the roots of unity for these particular number fields. Um, these analogs are called Stark units these days. It's still conjectural that it's correct what they conjectured, but it seems very plausible. And in fact, there's something called the Piadic case of this, which has been proven recently. That's what physicists would usually call a toy model of the real problem. Um, it's probably not so relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, so the situation at the moment then is that we have available algorithms which do two things. First, they compute Stark units for specific abelian extensions of these real quadratic number fields. The real quadratic number field is determined by the dimension in which you want to seek. And the specific abelian extensions is governed by something which Takagi called the conductor D. Then the algorithm 
uses these start units to actually construct exact six in dimension D. And the algorithms that have been presented, they actually work in every case where they have been tested. So if the dimension is n squared plus three, which simplifies the calculations tremendously, then more than 70 cases have been tested by now. It always works. The record dimension that we reached is 39,604, which is very much larger than any dimension where you can possibly contemplate doing a numerical search. But we can calculate the exact seek star or one exact seek. The weakness of the today's position is that we have no proof whatsoever that this always works. It works when we try it, but we have no proof that it does. So uh, we by no means there yet. And you might say, I was saying there has been dramatic progress and I'm describing 25 years of work and we haven't solved the problem. So how, how can I call that dramatic? Well, the timeline here is really sort of say that this should be compared to the amount of time the number theorists have been occupied with the background problem of, of describing these fields. They haven't succeeded in 150 years. So um, I think this is quite dramatic. But I was going to end by saying something, a somewhat different direction here. Um, so this is one way in which we try to construct seeks <clears throat> and try to prove that they exist in an infinite set of dimensions. There is another approach, which I, for the purposes of today, I will call the Swedish-Ukrainian. Uh, uh, Professor Benson, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, how many time do you need? Uh, uh, there's two minutes left, according to my clock. Okay. Is that right? Uh, we have uh, we are not in time in our pro uh, program, but uh, it, it would be great if we could have some discussion questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was planning to talk for two minutes more, but I can stop here. Great, great. Okay. Uh, let me stop here. Let me just say that there's an alternative approach. Unfortunately, uh, if you're in Stockholm or if you're in Kiev, you can you can ask some of these authors here about it, and that's basically what. I was going to say. So, questions, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, dear colleagues, let's uh, uh, may, maybe somebody uh, wish to ask questions, uh, maybe comments. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Danilo Akimenko, please. And okay, also, uh, after that, we have questions in our room. Okay. So, uh, do you know uh, something about the number of uh, solutions up to the equivalences? Yes. This has been, this question was settled basically by, in this paper here, by Kopp and Lagarius. You will find it on the archive. So, it's been settled this year. Uh, well, conjecturally settled. So the story is that Scott and Grassel, in their numerical searches, claim that with high probability, they have identified all uh, unitarily equivalent seeks in every dimension, up to 50 actually, is what they claim. Uh, they are very careful people, so they are presumably correct. And it's a rather confusing spectrum. So typically there are several unitarily equivalent seeks in every dimension. And the number of those varies in a very strange way. What Kopp and Lagarias realized was that the spectrum of seeks can be predicted. So what Appleby and Sauner and Appleby and, and the, the, the two the two Applebys realized was that the number field in a given dimension that's supposed to give six are abelian extensions of the square free part of this number here. What Kopp and Lagarius have realized that if it, this isn't square free, so there's a square, an integer square occurring here, which doesn't affect the real quadratic field. But it turns out that this integer here together with some completely new number theory that they have developed, 
determines the spectrum of the seat. And it fits. So they have a prediction for the number of unitarily inequivalent seeks in every dimension. And in every dimension where Scott and Grassel claim that they know that, know the answer, the answer agrees. So that question has probably been sort of settled in the sense that there's a conjecture on the table, which is probably right. It has not been proven. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and we also have uh, two questions uh, uh, from uh, our, our audience. Uh, Professor uh, Semenov. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk, uh, uh, Professor Benson. I have a question. I see a lot of, and a lot of people see a lot of analogy between six states uh, in infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces and coherent states in infinite dimensional spaces. Yeah, there are also very important differences between them. Mm -hmm. uh, but however, transition for when d to infinity is not for clear, at least for me in this case. Sorry, uh, I didn't get. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Uh, I heard everything except the last part. Okay, transition transition to infinite dimensional case when d to infinity is not really clear, uh, at least to me. Yeah, uh, can you comment a bit? Is uh, there are some uh, works on uh, this topic that what we have, for example, uh, when we consider six states in this limited case, or maybe there exists some analogy for coherent states in infinite dimensional states, which are full analogy of uh, this, uh, for this case. So how to connect these two words, infinite dimensional space, continuous variable, uh, and discrete variable? I think these are very good questions. Unfortunately, I know almost nothing about them. So there is very little I can say. You're, of course, right in saying that they like coherent states in the sense they group orbits and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but it's extremely unclear to me what... The, I simply don't know. The answer is don't know. I just observed that uh, as the dimension grows larger, the mutual scalar products here go to zero. So... Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's a very interesting question, but I don't know. Okay, so, thank you very much. For me also. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Semeno, for a nice question. And uh, uh, Professor Benson, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. We... There are two questions. Uh, there are, ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, there are two questions in uh, Zoom. Unfortunately, I can't see uh, raised hands. Uh, probably... Uh, if somebody wants, please uh, ask from Zoom. Okay, okay, so... Okay, dear colleagues, we, we uh, have to be in our uh, program. Uh, and uh, let's thank uh, to Professor Benson once again. And uh, continue our session, so... Uh, the next speaker is 